Uh, you can take your Bibles, turn to Leviticus 16. We're going to need Leviticus 16 here in just a bit. Um, welcome to Good Friday, uh, which is, um, uh, when, when you look around at, at the world we live in and, and the ways that we as, as humans have tried to explain our existence, Good Friday makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, w- w- most of us don't think of suffering as a key component to our existence. I mean, we have, uh, we have billion and perhaps trillion dollar industries hoping to alleviate suffering in some form. Most of the time, our prayer request list, though um, we certainly should pray for one another's physical ailments, we're told to, in fact, in Scripture, oftentimes they are less of a testament of perhaps our faith that God will heal and more of a testament of our fear of suffering and death. Uh, I don't remember who it was that said it, but they said we, if we spent half the time praying for people to come into the kingdom, that we do praying for people to not go into the kingdom. What would that look like? So we, we live in a world where we, we are terrified. So we live in a world where we are consumed by not suffering or feeling pain of any sorts. We, we, we desire delight, right? Most uh, religious systems are at their core, an effort to explain away pain and to celebrate glorious celebration, right? To, to celebrate happiness and joy. Um, and then there's Good Friday, where on Good Friday, we see our God on a cross yelling, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forgive them for they, not know, or they don't know what they are doing. We see a Christ who is beaten to the point that he was barely recognizable, fulfilling what was said in Isaiah. We see his own disciples fleeing from him and the crowds fleeing towards him in order to own his garments, in order to be a part of celebrating the destruction of the God-man. And above his name was, here is Jesus, the king of the Jews, and even the Jews said, we do not want this king. So even in his suffering for his own people, the the people did not want this king, a rejected, dejected, and suffering Christ, who at the end of the day, when all things are said, he does not call down the angels like the mockers tell him to. He does not save himself like the Pharisees tell him to. Instead, he dies and is uh, confined into a tomb like a common man. Dying just like everyone else. And that night, everyone laid their heads down and they went to sleep. And that's what we celebrate. Everybody else gets a party. Everyone else gets a celebration, a feast, something. The Day of the Dead lasts for a week, right? All these other celebrations go so long. And yet, we have a Christ who went to a tomb. And uh, I I think... Regardless of where we are on our faith walk, whether we are just beginning or whether we have been on this faith walk for a period of time, no matter where you are in your maturity, um, it's often good to recalibrate, isn't it? It's good to be reminded of why Good Friday is good. And that perhaps our version of good is misunderstood. Right? Perhaps in our world, um, and I don't blame the secular world for hijacking Easter. I don't expect the secular world to. That's what the secular world does. They do what the secular world wishes. I want us to understand what good means, though. Why is it good? We don't have to be worried about what the world is saying. We have to be worried about what our Christ has said and what he has done. So with that, I I want to, uh, this evening, it's not going to look like a normal, uh, by the way, I know when I said Leviticus 16, some of you guys got really scared. Um... Uh, I promise you, we're going to be in Leviticus 16 for the bulk of our time, but um, the sermon's going to look a little different tonight. We're going to take a bit of a journey, if you will. We're going to walk through answering this question, why? Which I'm sure the apostles and certainly Mary asked, why? John tells us that oftentimes the disciples didn't understand why Jesus did something until after he died. And then even if you read the book of Acts, sometimes it doesn't seem like they understood it for 10 years later. They're having to have entire councils to straighten out what Jesus said and make sure they're understanding that correctly. So if that was the disciples, I think it's worthwhile for us to take a similar posture and have to 
remember what our Lord did and why he did it. So with that, let me pray for us, and then we'll get going. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many gifts, and we thank you for the grace that you have given us. Father, we thank you for... um, We thank you for the reminder that you understand the depths of our sin. You paid a price that we will never understand. To redeem a people that, quite frankly, I don't always know that you should redeem me. And yet here we are, God. And so I pray as we reflect on the goodness of what you have done, I pray that we would be both humbled by it and emboldened by it. Thank you for who you are and for the plan which transcends time. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So if you'll remember back in Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth, and uh, he creates everything good. And as he's creating over uh, these first six days, things are good and well, and they're in their place, and things are set how they are meant to be. There was no death. There was no decay. Things are arranged as God pleased. And then he makes humanity, and he makes humanity uniquely in his image. And as he makes the birds and the beasts and the fish and all the other things, he makes humanity and he says, this one is very good. But then his goodness did not stop there because in in Genesis 2, he, he creates man and he sees man and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Instead, I must do more good and I must create woman so that he will have a partner. And the creation account is filled with God's goodness. He doesn't just make humanity and then send them off into the world to hopefully populate. Instead, he creates a garden, a garden which is designed for their good. This is a good, happy place for man and woman to be. And in fact, his goodness extends beyond that because his goodness also made a rule. See, his goodness said, you may eat of any tree in the garden, but I will protect you from one. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So everything was good. God's provision was good. His restriction was good. Everything was good, and things were as they were meant to be. And then humanity fell. And in the most tragic moment of our world, with uh, arguably a single bite, Isn't it interesting? Our stomachs get us in so much trouble. But it was the very provision of God that we hijacked. You may eat of any fruit. And so we ate of the one fruit we were not permitted to eat from. And in that moment, everything changed. God's goodness never changed. See, God in in the Genesis narrative, he he never changed. His goodness never left. It's not him who stepped away. It's not him who disobeyed. It was us. Romans tells us that in Adam, all of us have sinned. And so there we are in the garden, feasting on our sin. And God makes a way, right? God brings judgment, and his judgment is good. God judges the woman. God judges the man. God judges the serpent. And each one gets judged, and each one is told there's now a restriction. There's a space between us. And there's such a space that you may not dwell in my garden any longer. So he casts the man and the woman out. And very interestingly, after he casts them out, uh, he places a flaming, whirling sword. I don't know about you. There's an, there's an angel dwell, bearing a flaming, whirling sword. I'm scared enough of swords. I'm scared enough of whirling swords. But to have a flaming whirling sword seems to make the message clear. You are not permitted to be here. And so from this point on, there is a separation between man and God. Now, perhaps it would be the, this space would be remedied by man. Perhaps man was clever enough to destroy his relationship with God. Perhaps man will be clever enough to restore that relationship. But in that cleverness, Cain stone, or kills Abel. Moses is found naked after God's preser- uh, provision and curses his grandson. 
Abraham comes along and perhaps he is the one. And God even says, your offspring is the one. But we get a subtle warning there that yes, though Abraham, you are where the promise will originate from, you are not the promise. And we find that out very quickly. Uh, Abraham gives away the bride of the promise, not once, but twice. So if you're looking for marriage advice, Abraham's not your guy. He does everything he can. He doubts. His wife laughs at the provision of God, and so they have Isaac. Perhaps Isaac is the one, but it is not Isaac. And perhaps Jacob is the one, but it is not Jacob. Perhaps it is Judah. Perhaps it is Joseph. Perhaps it is so many. Perhaps even it's Moses. But at every turn, humanity in our um, wondrous uh, charm cannot fix the problem. See, we bring nothing to the table that we can fix a divine problem with. Right? Divine problems need divine solutions. Human problems need divine solutions as well. So ultimately, there is only one solution to all of the, uh, this separation that we have. And that is if the divine does something. May I introduce you to the book of Leviticus. The Romans of the Old Testament. Anyone like Romans? then you love Leviticus. See, what Leviticus does is uh, the, the book begins and God spoke from the tent of meeting, calling to Moses. And then he begins to outline, Moses, there is a gap between you and I. Here's how you may cross that gap. Ever so carefully as though your life depends on it. And in what usually kills Bible reading plans, God outlines his provision for safety. Understand that what may seem like some of the most boring texts is actually some of the most important texts. The law tells humanity how sinful we are, but also what the standard is to approach God. This is what is required. And so Leviticus begins with a series of offerings. You have burnt offerings and sin offerings. You have all these different offerings. And in fact, if you do all the offerings correctly, you can give the fellowship offering. And this is a chance to dine with God. So perhaps there is hope, but there's a problem. That separation is still there. Our sin is still there. And I think we who are near to Jesus forget what sin is. We who are near Jesus, we, we delight in God's goodness. And we, perhaps thankfully, but also tragically, forget what our sin is. Whether that's by underestimating our sin, or by neglecting our sin. And when I say neglecting our sin, I don't mean that you uh, neglect to participate in sin. It's that you don't pay attention to it. It's one of those problems that if I just plug my ears, my sin won't harm me anymore. Perhaps we think we have it under control and we can just leave that sin over there. But understand that sin is death. Simple as that. Sin is rot and decay, not just in our soul, but in our very body. We can't escape it. There's no way to become uh, perfected out of sin while on this earth. And so Leviticus, after the um, after the, the series of offerings, he, he discusses uh, the Moses is given provision about different kinds of creatures and, and how to deal with who, what you can eat, what you can't. And then starting in 12, um, you get this outline of why your body is a problem. Now remember, God created man in his image, so the body in itself is not the problem. The sinful body is the problem. And whether it's discharges or it's fluid after childbirth, or simple rot on your flesh, your body is a problem because it's not how it's meant to be. Which leads us to 16. Okay, so Leviticus sets up your, uh, God is giving us a plan of how to relate to him. And then he's telling us your body is a problem. You must be cleansed because of your sin. And we start in 16, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to read along, and I'm going to stop and make note as we go along, okay? So Leviticus 16, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of 
uh, two of Aaron's sons while they approached the presence of the Lord and died. So uh, previously in Leviticus, uh, Aaron's sons doesn't give their motivation. They just bring the wrong offering and God kills them. On that note, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat of the ark or else he will die. Why? Because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. We were designed to be in God's presence, but after sin, when sin is in our lives, when, when, and notice that I don't say when we have gross sin, when we have lots of sin, when we have too much sin, rather it's when I have sin in my life, right? When my flesh is contaminated with sin, I cannot be before God. And even Aaron, the great Aaron, cannot stand before God or he will die. This is a problem. How do we relate to a God that we can't even stand in front of? Well, here's how we do so. Aaron is to enter the most holy place uh, in this way, with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to wear a holy linen tunic, and linen undergarments are to be on his body. He is to tie a linen sash around him and wrap his head with a linen turban. Uh, these are holy garments. He must bathe his body with water before he wears them. He is to take them, or he is to take from the Israelite community two goats for the sin offering and one ram for the burnt offering. So what we see here is Aaron has to do a couple of things. One is Aaron must bring something other than himself. Did you notice that? He has to bring, and apparently it's quite a few things. We have, we have some burnt offerings and some very expensive burnt offerings, right? You don't offer um, a bull just... I feel like because we read Scripture, and read, when we read the Old Testament, we just see like, oh yeah, they're killing a bunch of cattle. This is your livelihood. These are expensive, right? These are uh, cows in the desert, shocker, are hard to keep alive. And these are supposed to be perfect ones. And so he brings them. And then he's also supposed to be clothed a certain way. He's supposed to have very specific garments on. But did you catch the final note? He's not just supposed to have specific garments on. He's supposed to be clean. So you wash yourself before you put the garments on, before you go get the offerings. And he, it's not only his offering, but he brings goats from the people. This is quite the entourage. This just got very complicated. Remember in the garden, they were just standing naked before God, relating to him, asking him how the weather was? And now all of this must be done? And then in verse 6, Aaron will present the bull for his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his household. Next, he will take the two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. I want you to note, we're not even into the Holy of Holies yet. We're not even in the entrance yet. All of this has to happen before we can even approach all God. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other uh, for the uninhabitable place, he is to present the goat chosen by lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. And the goat chosen by lot for the uninhabitable place is to be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with it by sending it into the wilderness for, uh, for an uninhabitable place. So Aaron shows up with these goats, cows, and everything else going on. And he casts a lot, right? So this is by choice. Aaron doesn't even get to choose how this is going to happen. He casts lots. One goat is sacrificed. The other goat we're going to impart the sin of the people on and send them away. Before any of that can happen, though, notice that Aaron and his household had to be atoned for. So before Aaron could stand in the gap between God and Israel, he had to be cleansed, wear the specific outfit, bring all the stuff. When he got to the entrance of the tent of meeting, he sacrifices a bull to cleanse he and his own household, and then he can start doing everything else that has to happen for the people. As we go, I'm highlighting how complicated this situation is, and I want you to remember in the garden it was not that way. 
in the garden, they stood naked before the Lord, and they were with him. And now we have all of this. And in verse 11, when Aaron presented the bull, or when Aaron presents the bull for, of his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he will slaughter the bull for the sin offering. Then he is to take a fire pan full of blazing coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and bring them inside the curtain. Finally, Aaron can go inside the curtain. And he is to put incense in the fire or on the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat that is over the testimony or else he will die. So remember, the, this whole chapter begins with, Aaron, your sons brought a bad fire pan and they died. I want you to bring a fire pan. By the way, if you don't do this correctly, you will die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his fingers against the east side of the mercy seat. Then he will sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers on the, or before the mercy seat seven times. And in the garden they stood naked before the Lord and they related with the Lord. So then verse 15, when he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the curtain, he will do the same with the blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it, Verse 16, he will make atonement for the most holy place in this way for all their sins because of Israel's impurities and rebellious acts. He will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. So in the garden, they stood naked before the Lord and just related with him. In this, in this day, there's a tent of meeting where God meets with the people. And even that place must now be cleansed because of the people's impurities. Notice along the way, though this is getting more and more complicated, it's not because of the Lord. It's not the Lord's fault that this happened. God's not hard to relate with because God is hard to relate with. In the beginning, they were naked and dwelt with the Lord. It's complicated because of our sin. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the most holy place until he leaves after he has made atonement by himself, his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. Then he will go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He is to go and take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns on all sides of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood with, uh, on it with his finger seven times to cleanse and set it apart from the Israelites' impurities. I don't want to lose that subtle note, by the way. That in God's act of allowing humanity to relate with him, there still must be separation. And in verse 20, when he finished making atonement for the most holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. You all forgot about the goat, didn't you? Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all uh, are all the iniqui all of the, of the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts, all their sins, he is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all their iniquities into the desolate land, and the man will release it there. So the image here is Aaron is bearing the sin of the people and is placing that on another. That's why it's called the Day of Atonement, right? We are placing the sin on this goat who must be sent off to be away from God's people. Because God's people are about to relate with the Lord and we can't have this sin anywhere near us. And so we get rid of it. And I think it's key to note as well, notice that the man who is to take the goat into the wilderness does not deal with the goat. 
Did you catch that subtle thing? We've sacrificed a lot of animals. This one, he drops off in the desert and sneaks away. And that's the end of it. He doesn't try to fix it. There's, uh, there's, um, these are legends later that there'd become a custom that they would lead the goat to a cliff to try to make sure the goat didn't come back to the camp. But the man does not do anything with the goat. He leads it into the desert, and then he leaves the goat. And in the garden, man stood naked before the Lord and dwelt with him. And then 23, Then Aaron is to enter the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments that he wore when he entered the most holy place, and leave them there. He will bathe his body with water in, the holy, in a holy place and put on his clothes. Then he must go out and sacrifice his burnt offering and the people's burnt offering. He will make atonement for himself and for the people. He is to burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who released the goat for, the uninha- or for an uninhabitable place is to wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Afterwards, he may re-enter the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be brought outside the camp and their hide, flesh, and waste burned. The one who burns them is to wash his clothes and to bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may re-enter the camp. I want to highlight here, they, as they're actively dealing with sin, at every step, they have to keep re-washing themselves. Because humans' best efforts still can't cleanse themselves from sin. Our cleverness doesn't help us. And so it doesn't matter if you're Aaron, if you're the guy leading the goat out, It doesn't matter who you are. We still have to keep cleansing, keep being cleansed. In the act of being cleansed, we're being cleansed. This is horribly difficult. And then finally, this is to be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month, on the day of the month, uh, or on the tenth day of the month, you are to practice self-denial and to do no work both the native and the alien who resides among you, atonement will be made for you on this day uh, to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you must practice self-denial. It is a permanent statute. The priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as high priest in place of his father will make atonement, He will put on the linen garments and the holy garments and make atonement in the most holy place. He will make an atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar and make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. This is to be a permanent statute for you to make atonement for all the Israelites once a year because of all your sins. And all this was done as the Lord commanded Moses. So not only... You have to have this whole entourage. You have to wear the garments. You have to be cleansed. You have to do this with this goat. You have to do that with that goat. You have to kill this, uh, this bull at this time, then kill this one at this time. Then you have to do this and this and this. And this. It only works once a year. Guess what we're doing next year? We're doing the whole thing again and again and again and again. And every time there's a risk of death because you are contaminated by sin. And Lord have mercy, if anybody messes this up, we know God will kill them because he's done it before. And so God presents a way for humanity to once again dwell with him. But they do not stand naked before the Lord. And we do not relate to him. And do you see the the dark place that humanity is in? God's goodness is all over this passage. See, God could have been really mean and not given the law. Not informed us of our sin and not informed us of the imminent danger of trying to relate with him. Instead, God could have said, figure it out. Be good enough to please me. But I will never tell you how to be pleasing. 
And in fact, if you reject God's way, you will do what Judges says, which is you will live according to what's good to your own eye. And the problem with that, as Leviticus 16 tells us, is your eye is contaminated by sin. And so we waited. And we waited. And we waited. And perhaps something new will come that will fix this. Perhaps it's the judges. Perhaps it's getting into the land. Perhaps it's the king. Perhaps it's anything. Exile didn't even fix this. Nothing could fix the problem. And they sent goat after goat and ox after ox. And nothing could fix the problem. Because remember, human problems need divine solutions. And divine problems need divine solutions. And so God sent his son. Who came to live a perfect life. Do you remember this child? I don't know about you, but when, when, when my daughter was born, I was so excited for when Charlie was born. But the angels did not scare shepherds to death. We didn't have like a, an angel moment where God, an angel had to say, fear not, you will have a child. Nothing like that happened. Mary is told, you will have the Son of God, and she says, and it shall be so. And so this child is born. And he grows up before us like a shoot, like the shoot of Jesse. And he walks a perfect life, quote unquote, naked before us. We see God like we have never seen him before. Can you imagine in the past when you saw God, you died? This is over and over, right? Samson's father Manoah, when, when he realizes that the angel of the Lord was before him, he cries out, oh my goodness, God's going to kill me. And his wife has to say, you're alive, aren't you? The whole promise to you was that a child would be born. Seems like you have to be alive there, bud. And instead, a child is born and God appears not like the ancient myths as a sea dragon or something amazingly powerful. He, he appears as a baby. And he grows up. And when he's a child, he firmly knows who his father is because that is where he will be is his father's house. And he walks and he talks and he tells us what God requires. You have heard it said, but I say to you, and the people heard authority like they have never heard before. Kings tremble before this child. Whether it's Herod or Pilate, they tremble. Because there's something about this child. He is blameless like no one else. He is perfect like no one else. And then God brings him to a garden. And in a garden moment, that child who knew the reason he was born turns to the father and says, I understand what must happen. I understand it better than they will ever understand it. If there's any other way, let us do it any other way, but not my will, but yours. And then the humanity who needed a savior killed their savior. They drag him to mock trials. They beat him. They allow foreign soldiers to put a crown on him in a robe. They bring him before Pilate. And even when Pilate says, I will give you an even greater criminal, the people say, no, 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 there is no greater criminal than being the son of God. And so they take him to the cross. Can't even carry his own cross. And they crucify him. But I want to make sure we see something in the crucifixion of Jesus. Do you remember how horribly complicated our sin is? In the Day of Atonement, sin has to go somewhere. And we cannot deal with it ourselves. There's one, and I had Eric read that passage at the start. I, I don't know if you remember, uh, all the way back at the beginning, we read a passage that talked about Jesus is already dead. But there's some notes about him. His legs aren't broken. 
His side is pierced. And he's already dead. See, we tried to kill him. But divine problems need divine solutions. And Jesus gives up his own life so that we can have atonement. He takes on the weight of our sin and pays a sin debt that we can't pay and dies his own death so that we can have life. So that we can understand the divine solution that is the gospel. That while we were sinners, Christ died on our behalf. He paid the debt. He cleanses us. He washes us. The only thing we realistically do in the gospel is bring our sin. And my, are we good at that? God brought the offering. God brought his son. God brought the healing. And so as, as we celebrate Good Friday, and I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure most of you had Good Friday dinner, or you, you've had some sort of recognition of Good Friday, whether that's just um, intentionally coming to service or if that's prepping for uh, Sunday, right, and, and getting to celebrate. I hope we take just a moment to remember our sin was gross, but our sin had to be taken care of, and we couldn't take care of it. Um, here in just a moment, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper and uh, I want to remind us that in the Lord's Supper, we have the perfect description of what Jesus did. This is, the, this is my body, which is broken for you. And this is the blood, which represents, which is my new covenant. It's a better covenant. Do this as often as you, as often as you do this. Do it in remembrance of me. There's something subtle between the Day of Atonement and the Lord's Supper. One had to be done. One got to be done. You catch that slight difference. Day of Atonement must be done because if the Day of Atonement is not, uh, is not accomplished, we die. But because Jesus has died, we get to celebrate our Lord. Um, so I don't know what happened this week. I don't know um, where you are in your walk. If, if you don't know Jesus, we're going to have um, a time of response. I'm going to invite Jeff and Vanessa up. We're going to have a time of response. If you don't know Jesus, if, if you are perhaps trying to cleanse yourself of your sin, if you're trying to wash yourself, if you're trying to make yourself whole, um, if you're using tradition, if you're using whatever it is, um, I can promise you none of it is good enough to do what Jesus did. Because what you're bringing is a human solution. So if you don't know Jesus, and by that I mean you have not recognized that God is good and perfect and you are uh, sinful and in need of rescue and that Jesus has died on the cross and as we'll find out, spoiler alert, rose again three days later to conquer your sin, that if you would repent and submit to him and believe in his son that you will have salvation and that he does not relent in his salvation. As much as God hates sin, he loves salvation. If you have never done that, never had that moment, I want to encourage you. Um, Pastor Eric's here. I'm here. I would dare to say any Christian in the room that you know who you'd like to talk with, they would be delighted to talk with you about what that means. But if you are a Christian, um, I hope that we'll take this time and we will still respond, right? We still have the Lord's Supper afterwards. Um, I hope you'll respond, God, this was awfully complicated before your son. My sin made things complicated. You fixed it. And I'm a benefactor, uh, or benefactor of that. Um, so my prayer is that, uh, again, if you don't know Jesus, uh, we would love to redirect the whole night to celebrating you coming to know who this Jesus is. Um, but if you do know Jesus, I, I pray that you would celebrate what is truly good, and that's the act of God on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this day, and I, I pray that um, where our flesh falls short, your spirit would excel. Father, be with us in this time. It's 
in your name that we pray.